Good evening, um, colleagues and audience members. My name is Ed Reising. I'm the chairman of the Land Use and Transportation Committee for the City Council. We are here this evening to conduct the fourth of seven public hearings in the community on City Council Bill 12-0152, Transform Baltimore Zoning. Today's hearing will address titles 10 and 12, which are the commercial districts and special purpose districts. This comprehensive zoning code rewrite is a very important time to learn about the general's public land use and zoning priorities. We want to hear from as many of our constituents as possible. Um, the uh, University of Maryland Bio Park has graciously allowed us to use this facility to conduct today's hearing. However, we must vacate the facilities by 9, 9 p.m. Yeah. Uh, I, I just want to see if everybody's paying attention. Um, we would like to thank Ms. Jane Schaub and the entire University of Maryland Biopark family for hosting us this evening. Uh, every hearing is open to public testimony and citizens may come and provide testimony at each public hearing. The following guidelines, however, will be enforced today and throughout this process. Persons wishing to offer all testimony must sign in and state their name, their address or community in which they reside and who they represent for the record. Individuals offering testimony will be limited to a single three minute presentation. The screen behind me, will, behind me will assist you with keeping track of your time. If multiple people from an organization or affiliated group are present, one representative should be designated to speak on behalf of that organization or group. Individuals may not sign in to testify and then yield their time to another uh, person. As stated previously, all individuals will be permitted to testify only once. If the individual has points they wish to raise that cannot be addressed in the, the allotted three minute time period, they can submit written testimony to committee staff at the hearing. If you would like to attend a hearing to testify about a part of the zoning code ordinance, other than the sections the committee intends to study during this hearing, you may do so and your testimony will be taken during the hearing. If you wish to provide written testimony, please mail it to the Office of Council Services uh, to attention Antoine Banks at 100 North Holiday Street, Baltimore, Maryland 21202 um, and or email antoine.banks at baltimorecity.gov. To my right is Antoine Banks. So after the hearing, if you need any information or you have amendments, you can. This is this is the man you give it to. Um, the, the ground rules. One of my ground rules is um, if you would turn off or put on uh, vibrate your, your cell phones, uh, an, uh, Androids, or whatever, to give courtesy and respect to those who are going to testify. Um, the, uh, the planning department will provide us with the report, which includes a PowerPoint presentation. Imme immediately after this presentation, all council members in attendance can ask two questions. After each member has asked a question, council members may ask a follow-up question. Uh, immediately after questions from council members, we would like to hear from you, our constituents. Everyone that has signed up to testify will be given three minutes. Um, at this time, uh, to my left, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the president of the city council, uh, President Bernard Jack Young. Uh, to my far right is Councilwoman Mary Pat Clark. To her, to her left is Councilwoman Ricky Spector, the dean of the city council. To her left is, the, uh, is Councilman Jim Kraft, who is the vice chair of the committee. Uh, we also join in the audience representing Mayor Stephanie Rawlings Blake is uh, Angela Gibson uh, from President Jack Young's office. Uh, we have Michelle Wurstberger, uh, Kara Kunst, and uh, Aaron Rowe, who's an intern for the uh, President's office. Um, we're also joined by Larry Green, who's the Director of Councilmatic Services. And to my immediate right, my immediate right is the staff person, uh, Antoine Banks. So at this time, 
Uh, we will be calling on the planning department to give the presentation. <coughs> while she's, while Laurie's coming up to my colleagues, if you have any amendments, uh, just present them to Antoine, and at the end, we will the, each council member, if they want to give a, a small brief report, you could. Well, you, we, well, yeah, if you have it all, you should still submit something on paper. Okay. Okay. Good evening, council members. Um, I will do the brief introduction. I've done it um, numerous hearings about the zoning code and then go into titles uh, 10 and 12. Uh, also, for the audience, there there's a member of the planning staff outside. If people have specific property-related questions or other aspects um, related to the code, um, he can assist with that. Uh, the zoning code, of course, is the rules and regulations placed on land, and the authority to zone comes to us from the state. Uh, the first zoning code in Baltimore was 1923, and our most recent code was 1971. And oops, there's a slide that needs adjusting there. Apologize for that. Um, and again, the purpose of zoning is to protect the health, safety, and welfare of our citizens. Um, and the zoning code is a combination of text and maps, the text being the, the sort of written rules and the maps being the geography and how it is applied. The maps are out in the uh, lobby that go with this. It, they are the regulations that are the first step in determining what's allowed to be built on a piece of property, how big, what type of uses. Of course, zoning does not distinguish between good and bad businesses and does not determine human behavior. Um, our last code was comprehensively updated in 1971. Actually, that was started in um, 1950, and um, it took a little while to do it last time. Um, at that time, we were in a different place as a city, more auto-oriented. There was an emphasis on separation of uses and preserving of heavy manufacturing. Um, our economy and our city has changed dramatically in that time, and therefore needing a new code. The comprehensive master plan adopted by the Planning Commission and City Council um, recommended that we do a new zoning code and that it fo focus on supporting and guiding city development and investment, protecting neighborhoods, strengthening retail, and promoting job growth. Um, these are the principles that we used in reviewing and in developing the code. And um, I'm going to go a little bit into the district regulations because the chapters that we're talking about tonight, 10 and 12, are within that section. So Title 7 through 12 are the district regulations, and they're organized in a similar pattern. Um, there's a description of the district, a table of permitted uses, bulk and yard standards, that's also in tabular form, that's how big and how far set back the building has to be, design standards, and then there's cross-references to other places in the code that might be applicable, such as parking or signage. This is a typical table, and how uh, if there's a P in a column, that's permitted, and C is conditional, and the far right of the table tells you if there's additional standards that would be applicable. We have used a generic use approach in this code, and um, that is important in understanding how this works. Um, in contrast to the current code where it says, you know, it uses as permitted in some other district plus the following and that sort of thing. Um, we have a much clearer approach here, and um, it's specific uses grouped into large categories if the impacts of those uses are the same. And um, this code does provide for specific uses to be allowed as separately when their impacts are different. And I will, I will point to some of those. Um, you know, for example, uh, we have retail goods establishments, which is a gen general use category, but pulled out of that based on community feedback are uh, pawn shops. Technically pawn shops, yes, they're re retail goods, but there's concern that they have specific use and impact, so they are treated separately, and they are more restrictive in the zones and where they're permitted. 
Um, this approach gives greater flexibility um, to permit uses in a broader context within a set definition. So each category, each generic use has a very clear definition and it el eliminates all these long lists and nothing can fall under two categories. That's kind of the basic rule and everything must comply with the standards. Uh, Title 14, we're not going into detail, but that's where you have the standards that go with the uses. Um, for example, if it's uh, solar panels or, or how the, the dumpster needs to be screened in a, a retail center, those types of site standards would be in Title 14 and cross-referenced. And each, uh, each use also has bulk standards. These are the tables typically, and this is where the height limits or the, um, the rear yards are listed. Title 15 is how things are measured and particular um, uh, peculiarities to the uses or the sites um, and clarifications there. So titles 10 and 12. Title 10 is our commercial districts and it's in five major categories. C1 is the neighborhood business that also has two subsets. The neighborhood businesses are essentially our main streets with, with two variations. C1E is neighborhood business, which ha includes entertainment. And at this point, that is, so it's neighborhood in terms of walkable, low scale, uh, small retail and small businesses, but it allows the live entertainment that might be typical elsewhere. It's actually only mapped at this point in the Fells Point area. Um, C1 Village Center is again neighborhood business, walkable, but for the lower density districts. That's the village center. That's where you have more detached houses, detached structures, and um, so you still have a main street quality, but a lower density. So they um, have slightly more restrictive uses and lower um, more setbacks. C2 Community Curve Marshall is the urban corridors. Heavier commercial is the shopping centers. And then the more auto-oriented and C5 is downtown. And I'll go into these with the pictures um, just to give you some examples of our main streets, the C1. Um, it does not permit the auto-oriented uses, the gas stations, the drive-throughs, that sort of thing, the curb cuts, and has um, clear height limits, design standards, again, to have walkable fronts. The C2 is your kind of in-between, your urban corridors, your larger streets, your York Road, that sort of thing. Um, still pedestrian oriented, um, they have provisions for some of the drive-ins as conditional, does allow for larger size retail, the, the, the bigger box units, but um, is still uh, has the design standards. C3 is your shopping center, that's where you have the, um, the parking in front and um, that large variety of uses, the very largest stores and that sort of thing. It's still limited, you know, you can't put the, the outdoor auto sales, repair things outdoor. Um, the only outdoor sales is for your garden center, that kind of thing, and there are design standards. C4 is the heaviest, most auto-oriented wow. district where you have the auto repairs, the, the heavier construction related uses. And C5 is the downtown, which I'll show separately. This is the use table for uh, the C districts. And I think it reads, hopefully, reasonably well there. Um, you'll notice in these tables, the districts are across the top. <coughs> and then going down on the left are the groupings of the uses. So the residential uses, the institutional uses, open space, and then the list of commercial uses in simple alphabetical order. For those familiar with the current code, um, I think this is much clearer and easier to read um, whether something is permitted conditional, or if it's blank, that means no, can't do it there. Um, again, long list of commercial uses here, and um, you'll notice the sort of um, additional uses, more uses are permitted as you go to the right in the categories, uh, reflecting the intensity of the retail. And this is the slight amount of industrial uses, um, especially in the C4 and the sort of other. The downtown is the C5 district. 
Um, this allows for a broad array of uses, allows very high density residential, uh, design standards for the different types of commercial, and um, it has its own sub-districts here as far as the height limits. For the most part in downtown, the largest area of downtown is the first one, the C5 downtown core, and there is no height limit. Again, that's the area that's envisioned to be the high density um, uses and that sort of thing. Um, and then there's some sub-districts that have height limits that go with them. So the reddish brown color on the map is the downtown core and the various others have the um, respective, their respective height limits. Um, this map may look a little unusual uh, sort of in terms of its boundaries. Uh, for the most part, the boundaries of the downtown are coterminous with local historic districts. So that's why it may be a little zigzaggy, um, but that is the, the thinking there. So those districts have their own sets of guidelines and purposes, and it would not be appropriate to have the sort of unlimited heights in those historic districts. Um, and that's why the boundaries appear a little bit unusual. Uh, for Title X, there were some amendments uh, presented from the Planning Commission, um, and I wanted to list them here for convenience. Of course, the Council has the full list um, in a little bit more detail, uh, but there were some uses that the Commission wanted added. Hospitals were left off, um, age-restricted housing, dormitories, research and development to be permitted in C5, um, car rentals to be permitted in C1 and 2, but limited to indoor in C1. It was brought to our attention that sometimes there are these new, smaller businesses that rent cars. It's all indoor. You don't see a parking lot and that sort of thing. And um, uh, recommended restaurants become conditional in C1 Village Center, and the commission recommended to um, eliminate the any additional height in the C1 Village Center and leave it at the base height of the 40 feet. And... Um, the, the leave the yard requirement. <laughs> Title II is the special purpose districts. 12. 12. I'm sorry. Title 12. Thank you. The special purpose districts, and I'll try to go through those briefly. The first one is office residential. That is pretty much how it sounds and um, is fairly limited. We have two types of office residential, sort of a lower density, kind of a row house height, and then a higher density that's primarily in the um, Mount Vernon community. Uh, the next special purpose district is the Transit Oriented Development District. This is new and very important um, for our city growing and we're trying to increase the usage of transit. These districts are designed to have that mix of uses around the transit stations and with design standards that orient the development to the stations and um, encourage that kind of growth and use around those stations. Um, again, the use table, similar format as the uh, District 10. I just included two sample maps for the TOD districts. Um, these are two existing tra uh, transit stations, Woodbury on the right, um, and the Reisterstown Road Transit Station on the left and the turquoisey color is the TOD zone. Um, it may be important to note that the TOD zone is not applied uniformly over the whole kind of quarter mile walk or the circle around the station. It's only applied where there's land to be redeveloped as opposed to, you know, if there's existing homes and that sort of thing. Also included in Title 12, the educational and campus zones currently uh, most of these uh, institutions are zoned residentially, which is really a little odd given that the use, uh, these use institutions for the most part are there to stay. They're, they're long standing, they've been there, and we recommended that they have their own zoning categories that are reflective of what actually goes on in these diverse campuses. Um, they really aren't single purpose, and um, so the uses are related to that, include, for example, in the educational, everything related to the educational, including residential, daycare, parking, related offices, and um, in the 
there's two types of educational, one the K to 12, but in the uh, university one, we added retail uses as well as permitted. The hospital zone has all the medical inpatient, outpatient, and that sort of uses related to hospital development. Mm -hmm. There are also provisions, there are regulations in the base district for hospitals and education uh, that are pretty much in line with what's built on these campuses and their height limits, but there are provisions for the establishment of a master plan to be adopted to reflect the unique circumstances that may exist. Those master plans would go to the city council for adoption. Those are, that is a um, recommended as a city council action um, if the, if the um, institution wanted to uh, develop that master plan. Just some photos of examples, um, and uh, this is, shows uh, educational institutions that are right up against residential, and um, so we, you know, made some setbacks and some limits on the height uh, reflective of that. Again, hospital. This is the table for the hospital, and in the picture you can see the way that these major, major campuses, huge pieces of land, major employers in many cases, but right up against the residential areas. Um, so we provided for height limits up against the residential and <coughs> setbacks and that sort of thing. <coughs> also in the special purpose, uh, the inclusionary housing, which is we did not change from the existing zoning, it, that's just moved over, but that lies in the special purpose district. Waterfront overlay, the map is on the left there to show an example. These are existing, right now we have a system of existing urban renewal plans um, along our waterfront and uh, we have reflected all of the language of those plans relating to the development guidelines in this zoning code so that we'll be all in one place and um, provide for the opportunity to remove those plans since they would be redundant. And this, this is primarily to provide all the rules in one place for the property owners and the communities. The content of those plans were not changed. It was simply moved over. Where there's gaps in urban renewal plans, there are guidelines in this code as to the waterfront promenade and that sort of thing. Adult use overlay is also outlined in the special purpose district. Um, it is recommended for only C5, which is downtown, and it's a two-step process, a mapping done by the council, and a conditional use after it's mapped. So there would be a two-part process to increase any adult entertainment. Row house mixed use and detached house mixed use overlay dwelling districts. Um, this was something that, that is new in this code and um, recommended as our, a result of our looking at some of our, our residential neighborhoods. We have many corridors, and I think these are examples, where the buildings are really kind of mixed in their use. Uh, they have some ground floor retail, and they, for the most part, lie on busy streets where we're not finding a lot of people interested in living in the first floor. So this row house mixed use overlay uh, provides for limited commercial uses in the first floors of these buildings in these districts. Um, the purpose again is to reuse uh, the older structures, uh, which in some cases have gone dormant because people don't often want to live down on the first floor in the residential zoning. That's all that would be permitted. Um, it is applied with design standards and it's only if at least 50% of the block face uh, qualifies. The detached is similar um, and that is um, again the, the map there shows the detached the little dots that's actually a portion of Liberty Heights Avenue where um, a lot of the buildings have no longer have a lot of the residential use and it provides for daycare schools that sort of thing in those um, buildings. Oops. Uh, the Planning Commission did recommend some amendments to Title 12, the TOD section, um, to make it clear that you exempt historic buildings, um, clarify the definition of front uh, to change. There was an error in the residential density for one of the TOD districts. It was out of sync, and to make that change, uh, clarify in the overlay, waterfront overlay that the specific language from the urban renewal plans uh, would trump or supersede unless if there was no general 
or Trump would supersede the general language, uh, to change the height limits in the hospital educational zones to, which are there at 150 and 65 respectively, uh, but to add the phrase or the highest existing building at the effective date of the code. And uh, to measure from the perimeter those heights <coughs> And to clarify in the row house mixed use, since they're already built areas by definition, that the non-residential uses should not be subject to the minimum lot areas for the buildings, since it's about reusing old buildings. And um, again, this is the mapping principles in general used throughout the city, um, and the <coughs> maps are available for the citizens. And uh, did you want me to take questions? Am I taking questions? Yes. That's yeah. the end of those two yeah. tables. Okay, you did the mapping? That's done? Yes, we're done. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, before we go to questions uh, for my colleagues, I just want to acknowledge we have Councilman Pete Welsh and also Nick Blendy in the back from the Mayor's office. So anyone, Mr. President, you have any uh, any questions? I um I have a lot I guess in a minute on my second go round I'll, I'll summarize my own amendments to these chapters but I just like to take these RMUs and these DMUs for a minute mm -hmm. I find them incredibly scary things um, and I'll tell you why I mean I read them a lot of times I took notes on, I mean Here's what I, I don't understand how a place becomes, all right, so what is it? It's a row house mixed use MU and a detached house MU is basically the same thing. It's just different kinds of houses that go through it and it's almost identical. So if I can just take a second. So basically, here's what happens. Somebody unknown representing half of a block face or somehow two opposing lots on a corner, like I, I get, that's what it says. If you have that much land that you're representing or that you are talking about, then you are entitled without, if you're zoned this way, I guess. I guess you have to be zoned this way. Only the council can map the RMU and DMU. Right, and I don't have any in my district, I don't think. I no. looked very carefully, because if I did, I would have. But, but 25th Street, I think, is the closest. Right, so I think we should delete the whole, the whole idea. I think that we should really delete these two categories, because they're if you want them to be businesses, zone them that way now while we're doing a comprehensive map um, so that we all know what to expect. But if you don't, um, I, here's what happens. Somebody comes up with half a block face, which is not even half a block, it's a half of one half of a block, or comes up with um, opposing lots. They're in a residentially zoned neighborhood. So the people around them are in houses. And without much notice whatsoever, if they meet certain, I don't know whose standards, they can have their first floor become a commercial establishment. And there's a list of what commercial establishments they can be and they're Restaurants are included, if I remember correctly, healthcare centers, et cetera. But then, it, but then you can also, while you're at it, you can make the second floor commercial use too, as long as it's um, not open to the public in the row house community. And so basically, um, maybe in the row house 
community, in the row house mixed use, you can have offices or another commercial use, but there's something about not being open to the public and in the, so basically what you can do with almost no notice, because there's no like action laid out about what happens, who decides what use you can have, who decides, well nobody has to decide about the second floor because that just seems to come by right. And then all of a sudden I'm living in a, I'm living down the block. I got a, I got a restaurant with offices on the second floor sitting in my, sitting on the half a block I'm not in. Now, that's not what I bargained for when I bought the house. And that, that's what bothers me about it is if that's, if these properties at this moment are unfit for habitation, but they're houses, rezone them for business. It is a zone. It is a zone. It's a zone and that says zone. you can do, somebody can do something mm -hmm. with these. We don't know what, we just know it's one of eight uses. You know these by heart. What, what are those eight uses? Retail goods, art galleries, uh, restaurants, offices, daycare. Health centers, um, health centers, clinics. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, clinics, mm -hmm. personal services. So I, um, I again, mean, it, it all is I'm a saying zone. Saying is, I think that we should take them out of the code. I think they're scary. They're they 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 they, they belie what you have the right to expect from a, a zoning land use code, and they 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 can create surprises that we're sitting there answering the phone. And that's how I always look okay. at legislation. Oh. And somebody calls me up and said, yada, 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 restaurant. I, it, and I, I'm saying, that can't be possible. You live in, you know. And I, I'm wrong because all of a sudden one of these MUs has mutated into from a house into a business. And that, that's all. Okay. It's not I even think a it, question. It, it, and maybe it's a misnomer. Maybe they should be titled business zones. And yeah. th they're very limited call in their it, mapping. Call them what they are. They're very limited in their mapping. We didn't use them all over the place. They can only be established through the map, which is through the council. Um, and they really are to the goal is to preserve some of the architectural character of those areas. I know you're familiar with 25th Street and some of those buildings, 25th and St. Paul was areas where it was mapped. Most of those buildings are three story and have residential above. The benefit of the RMU is that it requires the reuse of the building. If we zone them commercially, just straight out commercial, not mm -hmm. the RMU, they would be allowed to tear them down and do the kind of one-story buildings that would be more in a commercial zone, one- and two-story buildings. And so this is really a, a preservation of a maybe quasi-business district. So I would hope the council doesn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Well, there's no bathwater going on. I mean, basically, you have you, the planning department is not CHAP. If you want to save the architecture, you have an organization organized and prepared to help designate properties historic so there's hoops to jump through before you could ever demolish them. And th th this, is a, uh, this is not the way to go with this because it's got too many surprises in store for too many people across the city where these little zones are, and I don't know what they think they are, but what they are is the right, without further legislation or hearings, for somebody to put something in the first and second floors that are, uh, that are commercial uses in what looks like a residential neighborhood. And so we just have to be more transparent about these problem areas you're mentioning and call them what they are or what you want them to be. And I understand the dilemma, but this ain't the solution. And it scares me. I don't have any. 
I grabbed my map and went over it with a magnifying glass to make sure it, that it wasn't recommended. It's not. But I, I live awful close to, I, I just don't think it's the way to go. It's too scary for people. They won't know what they're looking at and they'll start screaming at us. And we will have done it by allowing this to occur, even if it's not in our district. Great, and I, later I would like the chance to go through my amendments. Okay. Wanna, um... Oh yeah, sure, here, Councilman. <clears throat> that, what, that wasn't my area, Laurie, but um, I'll just echo my support for the Councilwoman's um, position there. Um, I don't want I mean, it, it, the arts gallery, arts studio is always nice to start out in the restaurants, but I do not want another health care clinic in the first council district. Not one. I don't want, you can write that down. Not one do I want. Um, I don't want personal service establishment. If you look at the definition in that, that can be a massage parlor. I don't need another massage parlor in the first district because You'll have a massage parlor on the first on the first floor, and then you'll have other personal services being given on the second and third floor, um, and we don't get good taxes off of those services yet. So, anyway, we'll have lots of discussion on that in the work session. What I'm concerned about um, specifically here: um, why no form stone? Uh, that, would, I, that was a deletion by the Planning Commission. Um, okay. To be honest, um, that was probably a drafting area because we found that no one makes new form stone, so it was kind of irrelevant. And the design standards only um, apply to the new something new, and uh, the Planning Commission just deleted that. Well, I know that in my area, people are fixing form stone. I right, mean, it wouldn't, it it wouldn't, impact, that. It wouldn't impact that anyway as drafted. They are repairing drafted. and replacing. No, we understand that. Okay. And as drafted, this would only prohibit new form stone, not fixing it, but we didn't want any confusion, and the Planning Commission concurred with that, and that recommendation was removed. Okay, now, I am um, have particular concerns, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them this evening. Um, because again, we'll have time to talk about this during the um, during the work sessions. But in section 12, when we talk about the waterfront and we start talking about the development along the waterfront, I'm going to look at page 189, 12901, the W2 overlay zoning district. And there are other sentences like this, but this is part of the law. It says, to ensure a compatible development pattern along the shoreline, property owners are encouraged to cooperate as development proceeds in the W-2 overlay zoning district. How does someone enforce that portion of the code? Who encourages them? Who determines whether they have responded to the encouragement. I think there's uh, more specific language below that um, on right. the standards. And as I reflected, the Planning Commission um, uh, voted an amendment that makes it a little bit clearer for the user that the specific standards for, say, the Fells Point or the Canton Waterfront that exist today um, supersede any of the general ones that are in that section. So the general ones apply unless there's something more specific. Whenever and the I, more specific language is in there under the tables. Whenever I see that kind of language, it reminds me of these separation okay. agreements Fair when enough. people get, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, they get divorced and it says they're going to treat each other with respect and they're going to talk nicely about each other and they're never going to say anything nasty in front of the kids and, you know, if they could do all that, they would be We'd be, be glad getting, to work with you to take a look divorced. at that. <laughs> right. um, then on page 193, um, there's some, um, says, required easement improvements must be built and maintained by the property owner 
public access on private property is subject to reasonable rules and regulations adopted by the property owner and including in the easement the completion of the easement area must coincide with the completion of the adjacent adjacent development on the property who determines what are reasonable rules and regulations governing public access the specific standards are are in the code and in the existing urban renewal plans and um, there have been probably the best example is there was a property owner that wanted um, their waterfront promenade restricted from dusk to dawn and i believe that was put in their easement agreement which um, goes to the board of estimates i don't want board of estimates approving things but the language is reflective of the um existing urban renewal plans Ad additionally wetland marsh creation restoration and preservation are encouraged i don't want anything to say it's encouraged okay. i wanted to say you're going to do it or you're not going to do it um and then when this here yeah well okay. if we're encouraged uh, encouraged is not anything that we want to put in the law i mean we either want to say you have to do it or you don't have to do it right um right the um the other thing is when we are saying that things must coincide with the completion of something else somewhere somehow and we can talk about this through the work session um some's got to be said if you don't do it you can't get your use and occupancy or you can't get something there has to be some kind of um, clear. Next yeah, there, ha there, there has to be because we can't be in these positions where it gets all done and somebody says, I'm going to do that next week or I'm going to do that next month. Or, you know, um, this one's the one that really that, that really I love, but I want to see it enforced once. Any work done in designated habitat protection areas, resource conservation areas or existing vegetative buffers must be scheduled so that it does not disturb the reproductive cycles of fish or wildlife. I'm all over that. Okay, so I want to see who enforces that. And I want to see UNLs held up over that. Now, three cheers for the snail darter. Um, I mean, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Okay, so we need to talk about all this stuff pretty seriously when we get to mm -hmm. the work sessions. Is that it? Thank you, Laurie. Uh, the law department? Good, after, uh, good evening. Uh, the law department has no specific comments on these two sections, on these two articles. Okay. Do any of my colleagues, Mr. President, any of my colleagues have a question to the law department? No? No? Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, DPW. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Marsha Collins representing Department of Public Works, Department of General Services. I don't have any specific comments on these two chapters, but would be willing to answer any questions. Any questions? Councilman Council Kraft. Marsha, I know that um, the W2, uh, the waterfront, one W1 and W2 refers to the waterfront, but they do deal with wetlands and that sort of thing. Does any of this apply to the watershed does any of this apply you know to um lock raven or um the um liberty or any of our watersheds w what controls what happens out there well if if you're you're referring to buffer areas primarily the the more sensitive areas right. next to the waterways or the feeder streams yeah um the baltimore county um, code applies in those areas. We, they have a, you know, no certain activities are not allowed in the in the buffer hundred foot buffer strip or for steep slopes or uh, sensitive areas. And what what about our land? 
our land itself. Like this says, um, the thing about 12 foot, foot wide hiking and biking trail must be constructed in the area, which we'll have another discussion about um, on, um, not today. That way, but what about that? Who decides who can put a biking and hiking trail in the watershed? Is that governed by any of? You, are you referring to our reservoir? Plans? Yeah, reservoir. Yeah, that's all governed by our uh, regulations that are established by the director of public works. Okay, so that that's all done by rule and regulation of the Department of Public Works. Yes. And is that done by our legislative authority, or is that done by state legislative authority? It's, it's authority granted to us. By whom? By the state of Maryland. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, housing. Anyone here from housing? BDC's here. You have anything to report? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Kristen Mitchell for the Baltimore Development Corporation. Good evening. Um, I don't have specific comments to add, but I do want to vocalize our support for uh, what the planning department has done with respect to these sections. While there may need to be some adjustments based on comments I've heard here tonight, uh, we're happy to participate in those conversations. But um, we would just like to say that we think this is a tremendous step in the right direction for uh, Baltimore's commercial districts. And we did speak with a number of um, business owners in the commercial districts, in particular the main streets and the commercial corridors. Uh, so we have been communicating with people who will be affected by this. And um, you know, most of the feedback has been very constructive, but supportive, because this needs to happen. Hey, Krista, the president. Uh... Yeah, um, I want to be clear. Are you just talking about this section, or are you talking about the whole uh, rewrite? Oh, we're supportive of the whole rewrite, but um, since this uh, hearing is about the specific sec sections. Even, even where it takes the authority away from the council? Oh, I am not qualified to uh, I just to want to make sure Personally, you I know what you're, you're, you're saying when you're saying you support yes, all of it. Okay. We support the fact that this is being updated. Um, it's very important to update this zoning code. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any agencies that are here that I left out or forgot? Okay. At this time, we will go on to um, testimony from the general public. I think there's another one out there. Uh, okay. Uh, Larry Brown. Good evening to everyone. Good evening. I got three minutes, so forgive me. Forgive my attire. I didn't we, plan on staying long. I live right here in this district, 1003 Holland Street, Popperton area, Popperton Village, 1003 Holland Street, Baltimore, Maryland, 21223. And I've been here 16 years, and my main concern is are we going to still get along to get along? Because as you just referred to, and some of the other councilmen here, about what is and what is appropriated for people, clubs and nightclubs and all this other stuff. I just turned 50. My son don't want to be here. I try to get him to stay. He don't want to be here. He doesn't want to live in the city. That's another thing altogether. I don't want all the noise, but I can live with anybody. I can live with this great institution I was born here. But my problem is, who? what is this all about? Who is it going to benefit? Is it going to be sustainable to taxes for the businesses to stay here? Is it going to be sustainable for people to stay here in general for as far as taxes? I unfortunately shop outside the city because I find it beneficial. And then, you know, it's still that mentality if you all don't know the chopping block. I love, don't get me wrong, I've been here all my life. But I'm tired of seeing folk come in with this, well, I'm going to chop the place up. You know, I was talking to some folks outside early before all this, you know, the meeting even started. I mean, it's new. It's nice to have new residents here. I want that. I mean, Canton Cross, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. But I live right here, 16 years of it. Hopefully I'll stay here another 14 years and my house will be paid off. But uh, I don't have a whole lot to say, but uh, I do have a lot of disagreements, but I don't want to 
intrinsic on anybody's rights because I know my rights and I know theirs. That's, that's all I basically want to say. Yeah. Well, Mr. Brown, we look forward to see you, if you can, if your time allows you to come to the work session and give us your opinion. It's open to the public. When is that? Well, we're going to set the dates after all the hearings. We'll set the dates for the work session. It's open to the public. Well, I'll try to make it. Okay. Try. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll try. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Al Berry. Good evening, uh, Chairman Reisinger, members of the committee, council members, Council President Young, Al Barry, uh, planning consultant in Baltimore, speaking on behalf of six independent schools and also the Archdiocese of Baltimore, which I think has 19 schools in Baltimore City. And we're talking today about the educational campus proposal. I just, I know you have a letter, uh, my testimony, but just for the public, I'll just uh, try to summarize it. Um, the six independent schools uh, alone, just so you know, has 4,600 uh, 4, students, 1,200 employees, annualized payroll in excess of $64.5 million, and significantly over 50% of the enrollment and employees are city residents. Uh, the schools appreciate the city's intent to redo its zoning code after more than 40 years and provide more zoning predictability. However, removing the schools as a permitted use um, in the lower density zones and making them a conditional use will potentially limit the school's ability to adequately plan for their future. The proposed new educational campus district with potential city council master plan approval is a new concept for the city. By having this district be one of the zoning codes base districts, city council rezoning approval would essentially be required for any future expansions or reductions of these campus districts. The schools have serious concerns that such a requirement would compromise their ability to plan for their continued primary educational mission due to the inherent approval risk and the potentially large increase in expense associated with this more challenging process. All prior zoning codes did not see the need for specific conditional use or city council approval of educational institutions. Traditionally, these uses have had a permitted use status benefiting their nonprofit and social mission. Instead, normal bulk height limits were established for each district that they were in. Since 1971, largely due to each school's commitment to full community partnership with their neighbors, there have been few instances where a school's proposed plans have not been satisfactorily resolved. This community commitment and relationship is clearly demonstrated through the shared benefit of the substantial open space and recreational areas enjoyed by the surrounding neighborhoods. The concept of an educational district <coughs> is more appropriately handled as an overlay district, perhaps with design review authority by the Planning Commission to ensure public input into the, any expansions. These schools are simply asking for equitable treatment with city schools that are exempted from the new educational campus districts, and that placing any school under a conditional use requirement will compromise predictable long-range plannings by these institutions. The schools provide important social and economic contributions to Baltimore and are major <coughs> stabilizing forces within these communities. We welcome more discussion on this subject and ask that the council reject the EC district proposals as currently written. The schools look forward to more discussion during the council's work sessions. Are these the schools that... I have a question. Yes. Okay, you want, to, you want to name those schools? For the, okay. okay. Huh? I have a question. Boys Latin School, Bren Mawr School, Calvert School, Friends School of Baltimore, Gilman School, Roland Park Country School, and the Archdiocese of Baltimore School. Okay. Yeah. Combination of elementary yeah. and high Counts. school. Uh, yes, Mr. President. Thank you. Um, Mr. Burry, um, you know, I support all schools. But um, are you saying, and I just want to be clear, um, if there's a vacant shopping center that, you know, is vacant, and um, a school wants to locate there, you're saying that you don't want the council to be able to you know, do the zoning for that for the school? The, the, the current code would not provide for council approval, necessarily council approval, to go into a shopping center because of a commercial. I believe it's still a conditional use 
through the zoning board. Okay. Well, let me let me put it this way. Um, there's a school that's already in the, the neighborhood, and there's 30 vacant houses. And the school goes in and say, I want those houses to expand for our educational use. You don't think that the council should be able to say yay or nay based on what the community wants and not have it as a, just a permitted use? Well, the council under the current proposal does not have, would not have that necessarily authority. In other words, the planning department or commission are not recommending that the council have to ap approve any school expansion like you described. I'm, I'm going to tell you why um, I, I kind of like this. Um, I don't like everything in it, but I, I kind of like this. Um, because as we try to grow Baltimore and as we try to reduce our property tax rates to be, um, you know, competitive with our surrounding counties, well, we keep taking stuff off of the property tax rolls and because nonprofit does good work, but they don't pay taxes. And, you know, I want to see them grow, but, I, you know, I just, I, I just think that the council should be involved in that, especially when it's in communities where schools are trying to expand. Yeah, the, my clients are existing schools that would fear that the proposal would limit their ability to look at expanding, and the question is, who should be a, the approval authority for that? I think it should be the council. So, probably not. Yeah. Probably not. Yeah. I know. I think it should be. Okay. Uh, and this, Mr. Barry, I appreciate the comments. Um, my concern, specifically, is with the archdiocese. Um, you know, they're land banking buildings, and they have been doing it for years, um, particularly in my district. Um, I have a number of vacant schools, archdiocesan schools, um, that are sitting there. Some archdiocesan complexes take up square blocks that are vacant. Um, they've had people approach them to take those buildings over to use for schools in areas where schools are needed. They won't negotiate with them. They won't talk to them. Um, for fear of competition, um, and you know, they're not using the schools for educational purposes, and they're not being used in the best interest of our children, uh, but they are being kept off our tax rolls. I think that this allows us to have, for lack of a better phrase right now in this current discussion, a better um, point to start with the archdiocese in moving forward with regard to these properties. And if they want them to be used for education and they can't fill them with their own students, then they should allow them to be used by other educators for that. And maybe that's the way we get control of them if these are educational campuses. Um, we don't necessarily have to be operated by the archdiocese. In fact, you're saying that you represent um, independent schools and the, and the archdiocese of Baltimore. So maybe you can get the archdiocese to partner with these and maybe we can have eight independent schools and 17 archdiocesan schools. Um, and maybe I'd have two square blocks that weren't empty anymore. How about that? Okay. I will uh, discuss that with the archdiocese tomorrow morning. And maybe we have a more friendly person sitting in the top chair to end it than we used to have in terms of uh, being open to discuss the use of those buildings. Yeah. No, that's he's better there than he is on Cathedral Street. Thank you. I'm coming at this from a totally different place. So I'm catching up with what you're saying and what my colleagues are saying. Well, I know about the archdiocese not letting us, not letting a school use their schools that they closed. I can say that because I'm a member of the archdiocese. Um, but that's not what you're here for. Um, so here we have this new zoning designation called Educational Campus. 
what bothered me about it, and what bothers me about it is, we don't create the, well, I have amendments that would change that, but we have nothing to do with until they get a master plan. In other words, here comes uh, lines around, and I'm thinking more colleges, and now you're making me think about ele private elementary middle schools. Yeah, I'm not here for any of the... I know, you're not here for the colleges and all, but I saw it that way, like, and I worried about it because what the way I read it three times to see if I was understanding it was this. There's underlying zoning that they get to exempt themselves from. Well, no, this creates a special zoning that overrides the underlying zoning of an area. They then have what's called um, um, educational um, campus zoning. And the hospitals are just the same, hospital campus zoning, okay. Then they come to I don't know where with a master plan or a general development plan if they're a hospital. And then that goes through some kind of process. And at the end of that process, it's a, it's, it is a PUD. It's like a PUD. At the end of that, but no, but it's different in one way. We, le we don't have, all right. So it's like a PUD, a planned unit development. But then once it's approved, whoever, well, I would have the city council approve it. Once, once it was approved, and it does come to the city council for that. Well, I've got an amendment about that too. But, but once it's approved, and that the council is supposed to do, then basically there's nothing, that's the end of it. They can do what they want <coughs> with that plan into infinity after the master plan is approved. Zoning will not, we won't be back into the game. So that's what's <coughs> worrying me about it because I worry about, you know, boundary changes of universities and all. So when you're saying that it's a conditional use, it's what do you mean by that? Because it's not a a conditional use as I understand conditional use. Why do you say it? Well, I don't think it's fair for me to repeat what the planning department has outlined as a process. I think that could be a discussion that could take maybe 20 minutes or so, and I'll be glad to try to summarize what it's I think. It's not worth it discussing because it's so it's, well, it's confusing. It, the, the planning department, as we understood the proposal, was to create an overlay, or a, what I would suggest would be better handled as an overlay district so <clears> that people around that district saw that it was not a residential zoned property, it was really a campus. Call it what it is, whether it's a hospital or a campus. Mm -hmm. And that has some you know, merit. merit to it in and of itself. But they, but they should own it. It can't be just land that well, they kind of want to own. I, or I don't want to say this with 100% well, certain. No, no, no. But what I, my understanding is that this zone is not being put on property that, are, that is not owned by either a hospital or okay. a school. Good. I can't say that I've looked at every property for every hospital. For yeah. Every hospital. The city's not doing that for its, its schools, for example. It, they're not listed as EC zones, but the private schools are. So that's some inequity. Okay, but, but that's not a con so what, no, why is so it the conditional? Condi that's so the conditional use, as we understood it, uh, by and it, not all zones. The higher density zones, schools are or commercial zones. Some schools are permitted. So, but the conditional use is a zoning board conditional use. There is a general trend in the, in the code, whether one likes it or not, to change what was formerly conditional uses by the council to conditional uses by the zoning board. So the vast, if not all, the zoning conditional uses would now be under the current proposal by the zoning board. Yeah, but we're not going to let that happen. I mean, well, that's not going to happen. That's, that's, 
your prerogative. That's your another prerogative. discussion. That's a, that's a broader discussion. Well, well, it's it's not a long discussion. <laughs> See, we're not here to to. But get tell into me the, why you say the use the term conditional use. I in, don't understand. In the lower density zones, there are essentially two options that a school <laughs> would have to take over additional property and use it for a educational purpose. The first would be to have a master plan approved by the city council, similar to a PUD. In other words, a development plan would be submitted to the council and the planning commission and the city, and that would be and that would give them development rights approval uh, the into the future within that within the, the four corners of the boundaries. And there would be an amendment process, presumably, if they want to change There's that. It's not in the code, but go ahead. But so that's that's one option. The second option is that, and I think I'll give the planning department credit for this, is that they did grandfather in existing campus developments so that they could, in fact, continue to operate as conforming uses and they could they could build on their existing campus within the EC zone by right if it fell within the new height guidelines and setback guidelines. For EC for, districts. For EC districts. The issue would be if a school were to buy an adjoining property and wanted to use it, then the second option is it's a conditional use. They would go to the zoning board and they would apply to the board as a conditional use and the board has legal standards they have to meet to get that conditional use. You mean approved. it's a condition, I'm sorry. So in the table, of uses for EC. There are it in the is lower a density conditional in the use. lower density zones it is. In some zones it's a permitted I use. got you. All so we're suggesting isn't it now? No. No. Oh no, schools, schools are, are permitted everywhere. Schools are permitted everywhere. So that's what you're saying. Yes. In the current code you can have a school anywhere. Yeah. In the new code it's proposed that some of the in some districts it's a conditional use. It'll be like probably by the zoning board or maybe it'll by the zoning by board. The city well, whatever you ultimately decide. Right. But it's a conditional use. Right. We, go ahead. I got you. So, but that that doesn't really. All right. So I'm. It's not the whole campus idea that's bothering you. It's those seeds in the tables. That's the that's the primary. We believe that there are. I got it. That there are. Should, they should be considered an alternate method to ensure some public process that schools have to use when they want to develop something that might be impactful. We don't object to that, and we're suggesting that that be a process through the Planning Commission as opposed to a quasi, you know, a political process, frankly. Oh, God, <laughs> so we, we just think we need to have more discussion. The planning department needs to be clear to you how these will work. They've been very forthright with us how they think it might work. They've been certainly willing to amend some of the original proposals for how ECU, EC districts would be called. And I think we'd like to work it out with you over the next uh, six months. So you're or trying to get rid of the condition of use. That's right. Right. Uh, Mr. Barry, this is really a very opportune time to be discussing the uh, the school permitted use uh, and possibly a, a work session issue. We have maybe 29 public schools that will be recycled because of the um, 21st century school uh, initiative. Sure. It's over a 10 year period. And I'm not sure that that's been factored in. It has been factored in because right now it's permitted because it's a public school but we don't know as those buildings become surplus what happens to that. And so I think that's really, uh, Mr. Chair, something that we're gonna have to really dissect and digest because that's, that's city-owned property. We don't know where that's going and whether if, if a school uh, does change hands to a, it becomes surplus and then stays a school it wouldn't be permitted, it would then be conditional use by well, virtue of the fact that it's not the public school, it's now being purchased by independent or uh, a private or a charter school or something like that. Yeah, I would suggest that one reason the city chose not to have the EC zone district on their schools 
was for that purpose. That's what I'm saying. So that they did not want to have to go back to the council to get it rezoned if it was going to be used by a private for a private use. But I don't know that if it's if it's a public school, it is permitted. But if it's if it recycles to be something other than a public school but an educational facility, it would have to be conditional use. Depends on the zone, but in according Florida, according yeah. to the bill. Yeah, that, that's what I needed to clarify. There's 29 of us. The reason the public schools do not have the EC zone is really because most public schools, unfortunately, don't have the kind of campuses that some of the schools that are being discussed here. That's not they are Northwestern High School. That's there are very few that well. have that kind of space. Secondary schools. I understand. Um, so the reason they don't have the EC zone is because they don't have the, that campus nature. They are single purpose. They are just for the school. They don't have a mix of other things the way these larger institutions do. And they are, are being treated equally in that if they are in the lower density zones, they are conditional uses just like the private schools. If they're in the higher density zones, they're permitted uses just like the private schools. So they are not being treated differently. And they are, we are aware of the, you know, the new school plans and that sort of thing. And they are being zoned alike their surroundings. So if it's a school in a low density zone, it has a low density zoning, residential zoning, residential. if residential. If it's a school in a high density residential zoning, it has that zoning. So they are being zoned to match the surroundings in which we sit, very similar but, but to the existing code. But if it ceases to be a school? If it has the zoning of the community it sits within. So it, it does not have... It doesn't, it's not a permitted use because it was a school when it was when it was operating as a public school. I'm not sure I understand the question. Just because it was zoned residential. It's residentially zoned, and it's either would become a legally established um, conditional use or a permitted use, depending on the zone in which it sits. So there's very good accommodation for those schools and we believe with adequate protection of the surrounding communities. Did you need it? Got it. So, I wish, I, I promise I will. Do you want to, do you have something to say, Karen? No, that's okay. I'd like to, I'd like to. To my colleagues, remember that this is being taped and we need to speak into the microphone. Uh, at this time, uh, Joan Floyd, and then after Joan Floyd is Douglas Armstrong. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, David Lynch, my apology. David Lynch. I'm sorry, Joan. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. I'm David Lynch. I'm an attorney with the law office of G. Macy Nelson. I'm here tonight um, speaking on behalf of Ben Ray, a citizen who lives in Remington, and also the Joint Labor Management Fund, or the JLM. And the JLM <coughs> is a coalition of interests of grocers and unions that work on issues in which they share common interests. Um, tonight I'm here to testify about the proposed code's failure to address big box retail and the trend of big box retail to expand into highly populated areas like Baltimore City. Um, I have detailed written comments that I plan to submit following my testimony tonight, so I'll just briefly summarize those points. Thank you. Um, under the current draft of the proposed code, a big box retail store falls within the defined use of a retail goods establishment. Um, that can be found on page 56 of the code. A retail goods establishment is an expansive definition. It includes small corner convenience stores and big box retail stores. There's no distinction at all in the code between a small corner store and a re big box retail store. Under the proposed code's use table, big box retail stores are permitted as of right in all commercial zones. That includes the C1, C2, C3, C4, and C5 zone. 
The reason this is important, big box retail has numerous unique impacts that are different than other smaller stores. It has aesthetic, aesthetic impacts. Um, big box retail stores can destroy a community's sense of place. And they also have economic impacts. They pay low wages, um, which has an overall negative impact on a community, which is much greater than any positive impact the big box stores jobs may bring. Um, big box stores displace sales at existing businesses, which force those businesses to close or downsize. And studies show that local stores generate greater benefits to local economy than big box stores. So for these reasons, in order to facilitate orderly development, we urge this committee to amend the proposed code in three ways. First, we recommend to establish a definition of a big box retail store. Our proposal is that it should be defined as a single-use building that occupies at least 75,000 square feet of gross leasable area. Two, we recommend that the big box retail be a conditional use only in the C3, C4, and C5 zones. And finally, we recommend that a conditional use analysis include a finding that the proposed store would have no undue adverse economic impacts. Thank you. Mary Pat, you want to ask a question? No, I want to give a Mary Pat, you got it. If you're going to speak, you need to use the mic. Uh, never mind. Just say it again. Sure. Um, Councilwoman Spector. There's, there's, the, last two port, the last two recommendations were to make a big box, after the big box store has been defined, to have it be allowed only as a conditional use in three commercial zones, the C3, C4 and C5 zone, and as part of the conditional use analysis, require that a finding be made by the fact finder that that proposal has no undue adverse economic impacts. In, in um, today's um, development for major food stores, um, the average one is 70 or 75,000 square feet. So you would put that in the category of a box store, which is a retail. It could be, I think. The, the, the one I'm thinking of happens to have a bakery and a pharmacy and many, even a bank. So, so you would consider a food store a box store as well? Well, our proposal um, is for... You're going by 75,000 square feet. Right, and that's not a hard line. It's just you know different jurisdictions draw that line different places, 75 is sort of the average between um, the jurisdictions. But, um, you know, if a food store is higher than the, you know. The so what I meant was be. you're just simply saying any retail store that is 75,000 or more square feet well, needs our, to be in the C3, 4, or 5. Right, we're trying to work the best we can within the code. By calling it box stores, you, you threw me off. That's what I'm saying. Because food stores, major food markets have that size now. Some do, yeah. And I don't call, I don't consider them a box store. Box store, I think, is dry goods retail kind of merchandising. Right. Well, I think there's room in the definition to. You know, but what I'm trying to understand is, if it was a food store that was seventy-five thousand, and neighborhoods need these kinds of stores now as they're getting re uh, renovated, they need a store that can that contains a bakery and a pharmacy. It's a one time one stop shop that that would not be allowed to be in the lesser C, C categories, a food store. Well, just to respond, generally, food stores are less than 75,000. I know there are some exceptions where there are larger, um, but if it was located in a... The one that we have, are just putting up in, our, in, our, in my district is 75,000 square feet. The, sh the, sh the, the shop, the shop right in Howard Park. I just, I just know it's not a box store; it's a food store, and it would, it would not be able to be in a C one or a C two, if, 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 if it's going by size, if it's going by size, not the identification of what it's merchandising. That's, that's my point. Right. Okay. Oh, we could take, I mean, maybe we take grocery stores uh, out of them. Right, right. Other jurisdictions have done that. Montgomery County. Yeah, is, is like example. what I just said. Yeah. Okay, but that was not my question. My question to you is, 
go back for a minute and to what you said when you began, which is that big box stores are permitted in the neighborhood, C1, C1 um, Village Center, C2, the, the neighborhood and community level uh, commercial areas, okay, that are being proposed. Right. Now, there, I was just scrabbling around trying to find the bulk and, and regulations for commercial. I, I don't know why you said that, but you said it for a reason. What, why do you say that they are allowed there? Well, the land use table divides the commercial districts, C1, 2, 3, 4, right. 5, and there's a, it's permitted use in C1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Now, what, what is it called? Uh, retail not, goods establishment. Oh, retail so, goods establishment. Yes. It's, it's on the commercial, it's on the list of commercial, this Table, is open space. 10301. Right 10301, yeah, there it is. It's, it's where? Uh, retail, it's what, it's called what? Retail goods establishment, which is a very broad term. Well, there's a lot of broad terms in here. Retail, retail. Ah, there it is. Okay, with or without alcohol. With or without alcohol, right? It does, it's the same, right? Okay, so I'm looking at that. Now I'm looking at, oh my gosh. If I, I, it I, is permitted. I think there is. But are there bulk, are there bulk and yard regulations that go with this or and C1. if there are where are they for the c1 zone all right, right. Wait, let me let me look uh, do you mind if you don't mind just for a minute um all right let me look at this i've oh okay i'm sorry so somehow you've got to in your in your what you're handing us this could okay. I'm sorry, but I gotta I gotta listen to him while he's here. But I'll I'll let it go. That's my question to you. They may be permitted, but they they wouldn't be permitted if they can't fit and they couldn't shouldn't fit the bulk regulations and lot coverage size regulations of a C1 or C2, right. which I can't put my hands on. Well, I almost can, but they want me to not because they're people. Huh? May I respond briefly. The C1 district, the bulk regulations would not allow big box store. Okay. But the per, it is a permitted use on the table, but well, in reality, to stop, the, yeah. But it, there are, there are not similar bulk regulations for C2, 3, 4, or 5. And I would request that uh, because uh, you know I'm very interested in this issue. Yes. So I would I would very much appreciate it if you could delve into all that those regulations so that in our work sessions we could talk more about. How to, how to adjust to accommodate what you're saying. Okay, we'll be happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Joan Floyd, um, President of Remington Neighborhood Alliance. A couple things tonight. First of all, a request regarding the EC1, which is a request for an amendment to the minimum lot area on table 12. 502 at page 27. Um, it's unreasonable and impractical to require a primary school campus to have the same minimum acreage as a college campus. Please reduce the EC1 requirement. Our organization has requested EC1 zoning for 242 West 29th Street, a parcel that can accommodate a modern pre-K through 8 school facility, but is just shy of two acres and is just shy of one city block. So we ask you to reduce the EC1 requirement. Um, other issues very quickly, <coughs> on the office residential, the current OR1 has a residential density of 2,500 square feet of lot area per unit, and the proposed OR1 has a residential density of 550 square feet of lot area per unit. Uh, the proposed OR is subject to the neighborhood commercial category, which means it will not resemble the current OR with respect to uses. Um, now, quickly on the overlay. We were talking about the RMU earlier, um, but there's also that stealth RMU, which is the neighborhood commercial. Let's assume you eliminate the problematic neighborhood commercial category 
let's say you restore the minimum lot area requirements for non-residential uses and you reimpose a limit on variances, which is right now gone. The remaining way to permit conversion of row houses to businesses will be the RMU overlay. In order to ensure that adding the RMU is the right thing for a particular block, affected owners and neighbors will need the protection of a special legislative process that includes required notifications, procedures, and findings. The proposed code does not contain procedures for adding an overlay district. Adding an overlay district does not cannot be based on change or mistake rezoning standards. It must be based on a specialized set of requirements. Um, and a quick note on the RMU. The proposal is for outdoor dining and second floor commercial to be conditional uses. It's very important to emphasize that any uses you designate as conditional are presumed to be compatible. Conditional equals compatible under the law. Protesting neighbors will have the burden of proving otherwise to the zoning board. On the C1, as proposed, it allows taverns and liquor stores, whereas the current B1 does not. It is also nine times the residential density of the current B1. Out on the C2, as proposed, it's really a high residential density, high rise district, 300 square feet per unit. It introduces the concept of a height variance by conditional use, a new concept, forcing neighbors who don't want a 100 foot building behind their little house to overcome the presumption, again, of compatibility because because conditional equals compatible. I'll take any questions. Thank you, Chairman. Doug? Good evening, uh, Douglas Armstrong, uh, resident property owner, uh, 2828 North Howard Street. Um, I think this evening clearly illustrates the desperate need and, and requirement of this council, of this committee, and this council to have independent, dedicated legal advice. You need your own legal counsel to answer some of your specific questions and to give you advice regarding those questions. You've asked some very interesting questions and some very probing questions, and you have some obvious concerns you need your own legal advice to ally those concerns or to fabricate or, or construct genuinely good amendments to this code. That is absolutely imperative, and I'll keep saying that until I actually see this person show up. Uh, addressing one of tonight's topics, uh, the RMU, um, as you all know, and I've told you a thousand times, I've spent 25 years in the film business scouting locations. People paid me to drive around and look for stuff. So I've started going around and looking at some of the RMU districts and taking photographs. And I, I, I really disagree with the representations that were made by planning and um, that portrayal. And at a later date, I'm, I intend on presenting you photographic evidence to refute a lot of that and to illustrate, I think, some of the concerns that were expressed here tonight in a way that you can all genuinely see and experience. And I'll attempt to do that for everything that is currently mapped. Um, RMU. RMU. And, and DMU. And, well, no, I'm not going to do a DMU. I don't live in DMU. I'm an RMU. I'm a row house person, okay? Oh, right. I'm a row, I'm a row house. The, yeah. the detached can fend for themselves, thank you very much. Okay? <laughs> you know, I didn't buy in Roland Park. I didn't buy in Guilford. And, yeah. and and Doug, parents just, didn't leave Doug, me a just house. Just give your presentation, Councilman. I'll, I'll have to. I, I, well, after no, you we'll, cut <laughs> into his time, Councilman, let him finish his that presentation. That is that is my presentation. I will type it up and, and email okay. it to you. But I again, I really need to see an attorney back there who can whisper in your ears and say, uh, uh, "Let me explain this," because this I I feel like a lot of the description of what the code is is just that, but. There's still some very fundamental, in some of your questions, I see that some very fundamental misunderstandings or not full comprehension of what Euclidean zoning is. And that's what we've got here, Euclidean zoning. It has to be uniform across the city of Baltimore. It has to be rationally based. And as a result, you need independent legal counsel to guide you through that so you can make good, good decisions. Thank you. Doug, before you leave, I just want I just want to assure you that the the president of the city council 
who's here now, but and also um, this committee has, we have talked to the mayor. We talked amongst ourselves. We agree that we need independent Well, I, I'd, ra I'd rather you talk to a few names I could give you for people who yeah. do this job. <laughs> well, you can, yeah. yeah, you can, I mean, we, we, if I may, we, we agree with what you're saying. I mean, I have, I have talked to the mayor. I have talked to Nelson. The word is that there's consideration, but they haven't gotten back to us. But we're not going to stop keep saying to, to the administration that we want our own lawyer. Right. I think, in, and it would be very beneficial in these situations where council people have very specific concerns, and certainly in certain districts, you know your districts quite well. I know a couple of these places that, that Councilman Kraft is talking about because they've turned into film locations on occasions. So if you know, if you know what the lay of the land is and you're asking a specific question, it, it would be really beneficial. And you need that now because the public is here now and the public needs to uh, maybe get the same explanation so that they can understand it because then they can maybe make even better recommendations than the ones they're making now. And, the, and it can only benefit you. So the sooner that happens, the sooner you have the benefit of that opinion. One of the problems that we have with regard to uh, obtaining counsel is a budgetary problem. We don't have the money. Well, there's a parks department you we, can raid. Come on. We have, we, as you know, we cannot allocate funds. Right, I know. We are attempting to get funds um, allocated. We need the approval from the mayor's office to do that. Well, I, we, I, I know we that you can go finish. Some we have not been able to do that. We're actually having a hearing on October 22nd on the president's proposed charter amendment that would allow us to retain our own council. Um, this would be something that would go to the voters because presently we don't have that power under the charter, but we are going to pass this hopefully and send it to the voters. Voters would give us the authority to do it and then we would have our own attorney and we wouldn't have to run up into this problem not just on this piece of legislation, but on many pieces of legislation. Well, I would, I would, I, 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 and that's something that I know the council president and I have talked about, and I certainly have talked about it with you and, and with Councilwoman Clark. But this being a specific situation and a specific application and, and would be a, would only be for this particular instance, I think that I, I, I would think you could find a way around that one hurdle. But I would, I strongly support you getting full-time council representation to act as a as a, an alternate voice and a voice that can specifically address council people's concerns and constituents' concerns. I mean, we're all under the charter of the city of Baltimore. We all own the city of Baltimore. If we reside here or we own property here, we're owners in this corporation called the city of Baltimore. So I have just as much of a concern about what happens as everybody else, but my concern is because I've got skin in the game. Yeah. And, and that's where I, I really feel that's why I keep, I'm going to keep hammering on that. And I think you've got a way around that. And the, the full-time advice or the full-time legal advice would be very beneficial and would be, I don't think that that would have much difficulty at the voters. But right now, this specific application, I think, is imperative. I think we're all on the same page. We agree. Great. Thank so, you. So Doug. next hearing, we'll see somebody, right? Thanks. Hopefully before that. Uh, Allegra Best. Allegra Best. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Allegra Best. My husband and I own property in the Highland Town area. You want to speak into the microphone, please? Yes. Um, pardon me? I got it down. All right. So uh, my husband and I own property in the Highland Town area, Mr. Kraft. And um, we find ourselves in a position now with this new zoning that half of the property that we own is still remains industrial, I-1. The other half is in your new transit-oriented district. And I was wondering if someone from the planning department could speak to that special zone, to the transit-oriented district, and what that involves. Thank you. The transit-oriented district, if I'm not sure the exact property, but I think I'm familiar with where you're talking about, is um, 
applied to that area because of the future Red Line Station that is proposed. It is a very mixed-use district. It permits residential. It permits a full array of commercial. It permits office uses. And um, the essential requirements is the parking needs to be sort of screened and not in a big, huge surface lot. And that the building, new, if it's new construction, it needs to face or have a door to the transit station and that sort of thing. So you got to, you know, yeah. The reason we keep running this microphone around is because everything is recorded, and if it doesn't go on here, it doesn't get recorded. I, I wasn't clear on that before uh, we get the answer. Does that mean it actually has to abut the transit system? Uh, no, not all, the, not all the properties that have the TOD zone right. physically abut, they're all within the quarter mile walking quarter, distance. Right. I thought you said it and, had to abut yeah. it. No, it doesn't, I it want doesn't to necessarily that. abut the train station. Well, my follow-up question would be, the property that we own that is now in the TOD district is a parking lot. So I'm curious as to... Just ID the property. Oh, Fleet Street, Fleet and Haven Streets. Okay. Best, best battery company. Okay. So uh, we've been there for 60 years, and we have um, have our workspace on the one the south side of Fleet Street, and then the north side of Fleet Street is our parking area for our employees and customers. Will we have to do anything to that parking area, or are we okay as it is? No, everything existing would be grandfathered in, um, and then this would be if you you know if you were to sell and re or redevelop. Um, you would benefit from the transit-oriented zone. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council, Council President. Yes, um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. But um, I, I want to ensure um, all the citizens that are here tonight that this bill will not go anywhere until we get legal counsel for this council. This is too important. It hasn't been done in 40 years. If we want to get it done and get it done right, we have to have our legal um, uh, representatives here. So this bill ain't going anywhere until that happens. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, at this time, uh, there's no more public testimony. If there's any amendments from the from my colleagues, uh, Councilman, Councilwoman Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have to apologize to my colleagues and to people who have come out tonight for, like, basically just summarizing and reading into the record issues that I've written at, about amendments that I've written at length, but I just have to say them out loud for the record and then hand in the written copy that is more detailed. I have extra copies if anyone's interested, but in order for us to be able to discuss them and to adopt them uh, ultimately when the hearing process is ended. So, uh, colleagues, in the commercial districts, what I, um, and I'm starting on page six of the, um, the handout that I gave you, because the first five pages are from last week, and I'm just going as we go through our various chapters. Um, so the first thing, it's not connected. Well, yeah, it is. It's a new category of commercial use, which um, I'm defining is called medical dispensary. And I'm defining it as um, a faci any facility in which 50% or more of average daily receipts and, revenue and reimbursement revenue and of patient time on site is based on the dispensing of drugs and pharmaceuticals for on-site and carry-home consumption as opposed to for health examinations, counseling, and treatment of patients within the facility. And I'm asking that this be added to table 10-301 um, to be continued. I think my colleagues probably, probably understand my rationale. Um, um, there is a table of uses that was, has been referred to in which a lot of uses are listed and then they're either permitted or, or they're conditional 
or you can't have them at all. There's a blank. And I will be, um, I am submitting amendments around the permitted and conditional uses in the commercial zoning districts for fraternities and sororities, residential care facilities, 17 or more, community centers, cultural centers, places of worship, animal clinics, bail bond establishment, banquet hall, body, body art establishment, check cashing establishment, entertainment indoor, and under financial institutions, I'm adding a new category called ATM principal use um, because they seem to be coming principal uses and I don't really want them everywhere in my district. Uh, so also changing um, the use categories for health centers, medical dental clinics, um, outdoor dining, personal services, restaurant, goods establishment with alcohol sales, video lottery facility, parking lot principal use, parking structure principal use, and wireless telecommunications antenna facility in towers. So basically, in our in my amendments, which I'm handing in, I'm changing whether they're permitted uses, conditional uses, or no uses at all that can be allowed. But it's too lengthy now to go into, but you can get a copy of what I'm writing to the extent that you could possibly be interested. Um, I've got them here. Um, here, yeah, help yourself. So, thanks, Joan. Then, after that, um, I'm also planning to work with my colleagues on bulk and yard regulations connected with these commercial tables and categories because we have constituents who rightly want the original B1, C1 kind of densities and setbacks restored into what is their a successor C1, C1 uh, VC, and C2s. We don't want to up the ante in, in the neighborhoods. Um, and so I'll be talking about that. Um, uh, one, one amendment that I'm putting in that is, is not related to the, the readings for this week, I feel like I'm in college, is we've been talking about major and minor amendments. And um, I, 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 who gets to decide and what it is to a PUD, planned unit development. And so basically, I'm on page nine. Um, I'm recommending an amendment to the zoning that the zoning administrator be charged in our new code with the responsibility of determining whether an amendment being proposed for a planned unit development PUD is minor or major. That's an administrative officer that has already been given in the proposal the responsibility to decide whether a variance is minor or major. And so it seems very apropos. And because he's an administrative type, you can appeal um, his decision, the way you can appeal a negative appeal, and I'll, ask, I'll also ask that while appeals are underway, a stay be imposed um, on any action. So special, special purpose districts are next. And this is something, these la next two things are very important to me. So I hope you'll listen because I really need your support. Um, first of all, I understand. I've got to put this in the record, Councilman. Overlay districts defined and then overlay districts established that we have the right to approve them and to amend them. That we, the Baltimore City Council, uh, create them and amend them by legislation, not through some vague other process, etc. cetera. Um, then, I do object to these, uh, I do have concerns about the educational institution uh, campus and the hospital campus. I have amendments that I'll be introducing. My concerns um, have to do with 
a vague process that we, uh, the city council, uh, are involved in to approve a master plan, after which the text actually says that the schools themselves or the hospital themselves, depending, can, one, with an approved master plan, can go forward and amend themselves after that. And that's nuts. I, um, I have concerns about the inclusionary housing overlay district. I don't understand it. The whole city's supposed to be an inclusionary housing district. And so I'm not sure we need such a district because it's, I don't know who's being excluded by the inclusionary housing district. Uh, and I'm, I'm almost done. So Row House MU, detached MU, you've heard where I'm coming from. I, I'm recommending deleting entirely both sections. Um, and if that fails, making sure that, like other overlays, um, you have to create and amend um, overlay districts like these through city council action. And finally, um, on the adult use overlay district, I'm making a proposal that we, we're phasing out liquor package goods establishments. So um, they're creating, or somebody's creating an adult use overlay district, but it hasn't been created yet. But it will be, but it can only be at a C5. So upon the effective date of this code, adult uses will become non-conforming uses in all districts unless legally located in an adult overlay district and must be terminated with three years, within three years of the effective date of the code. Until the adult use overlay district is enacted, only adult uses located in C5 zoning districts may seek zoning board extension of this termination of up to two additional years. If that sounds confusing, it is. But it means if you're going to create this, let's phase them out every place else, and let's do it the way we do it, that we're proposing to do liquor establishments within two years and appeal to the board if you want longer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I wanted to ask you when you wanted to a, appeal a decision of the zoning administrator, yeah. is that to the circuit court? Well, the way it works now is you can't, you can't appeal the decision about minor or major because it's going to a place that's not appealable. All right. So the zoning administrator, when he makes a decision, you have the right of appeal, like of a permit, a, a negative appeal, okay? It goes to the zoning board, yeah. And so what I'm saying, so you have a place to go to carry your appeal. I don't like this. It should be major, it should be minor, it should take city count. And the reason that matters is if it's a major amendment to a PUD, it goes to city council. If it's minor, it goes to the planning. But I, it's similar to now if that late night business license, if you don't agree with finance, you, you can take it to the zoning right. board. So that's the same this pattern. The same that, that's what I wanted. I didn't know whether it was circuit court because if you want to appeal, right, the, the zoning board, you'd have to go to the circuit so, but court. But it gives you, first of a place all, to go. a neutral party because you're not having, because the zoning administrator is not Council going to turn members. around and be the person that decides on whether the minor amendment passes. He's just sitting there deciding he's a traffic cop. Secondly, you have a way to appeal that decision. Third, he's already doing it. For uh, in the proposal, he's already doing that kind of stuff. So this is more of that stuff. Yes. Thank you. I just want to announce that uh, there were two requests by constituents uh, for me to submit uh, changes: one for 4800 Seaton Drive and one for 806 St. George's Road. So I've submitted them for a work session. This is um, just a quick follow-up on uh, Councilwoman Clark's uh, issues, and again, it's for our work session to consider this. But one of the things that we've discussed in um, 
our prior rezoning efforts in Southeast. We've, as, as most of us know, we've done a lot of rezoning there over the last five years. Um, it was my understanding we were trying to simplify zoning so that if a person looked at a piece of property, they saw it and said, okay, my property is zoned X. Um, they didn't have to worry if it had a, um, if it was in a local historic district and then a state historic district and a federal historic district with a maritime overlay with a educational zone overlay with a whatever overlay. And all I want to do is make certain when we're creating all these layers that when somebody can walk in and look at their property and it says, okay, my property is X and it's everything is defined by that X and there's no question that there is no underlying anything if it's that X. And if you are an education zone sitting in a CHAP district, you know, that you know exactly what that means by looking at that. Or if you're a chap, if you're in the Mizod, you know, and whatever. But, you know, you, you have to have a one-stop shop and so that we're, we don't have these four, five, six zoning categories. And, you know, you have to hire somebody like Al Barry, pay him $10,000 to figure out how to read the code for you. I'd, Right, Al? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, I just want to reiterate that anyone who has amendments beside the council, anyone in the audience, uh, in the public that has amendments, is that here it is up here on, the, on the both screens where the Senate to, and um, Mr. Antoine Banks will be here after, after the hearing, when we go into recess. So, um, Remember this, this, the process is the planning department had it, it went into the planning commission, now the ball is, is lateral over to the, to the council. We will ha we're having hearings, we're gonna have work sessions, uh, and that's why we're having amendments. We'll probably rewrite a lot of this, going by amendments to hear from the general public. So nothing's really set in stone. And that's what Councilwoman Clark and some of my co other colleagues are trying to say. Um, at this time, um, the next full hearing on City Council Bill 12-0152, Transform Baltimore zoning will be held on Wednesday, October the 15th at 6.30 p.m. at the Baltimore Polytech Institute High School located at 1400 West Cold Spring Lane. And they will be, we will be discussing a hearing on Title 13, 16, and 17, which are planned unit developments off-street parking and loading signs. Um, I want to thank all of you for attending the hearing tonight, and please check around and make sure whatever you brought with you, you take with you. It's Tuesday? Okay, they had Wednesday. It's not my fault, okay. It's Tuesday? Tuesday, October the 15th at 6.30 p.m. Um, Thank all of you for attending the uh, committee hearing. Again, please check around um, your seats to make sure you take what you brought with you. And um, everyone have a good evening, and thank you.